Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians read through the book of Concord and discuss what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we're going to start Article 11 from the Epitome of the Formula of Concord, looking at the status of the controversy, that is, what is the issue that needs clear confession with regard to the teaching on God's eternal foreknowledge or predestination and election. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dole Parish of Emmanuel West Point and St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. My companion confessor in conversation about this article today is Pastor Jonathan Lang. He is the pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dole Parish of St. Paul Lutheran in Kemmerer, Wyoming, and also our Savior Lutheran in Evanston, Wyoming. Pastor Lang, welcome to Concord Matters. Thank you, Pastor Smith. It's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, and it is certainly a real honor to have you on the show today. I also want to take this opportunity to share with our listeners some work with the Book of Concord that you have done in recording the audiobook of the entire Book of Concord that is in the public domain and is free available through LibriVox. I highly commend that to our listeners. I brought it up once quite a long time ago on the show and commended that then. But especially with you on today, I certainly wanted to re-bring that up and share that with our listeners. It's certainly been a very helpful blessing to me as a rural dual parish pastor. I often spend quite a bit of my time on the road just to drive to various places. And I find it a very good use of my time to listen to audiobooks. And so, for instance, for the past few months with the COVID-19 situation, in order to continue ministering to uh, several of our members who are taking the precaution to remain at home on Saturdays, I've been making a round of deliveries with at-home audio recordings of a worship service and sermon on CD, and then also visiting them with the sacrament. And that's just about a hundred miles round trip for me. So I've been using that time to listen to the entire book of Concord. So it may sound a bit weird, but your voice has literally become the voice of the Lutheran confessions for me. But sincerely, it's been a real blessing for me as I always try to read through and review the Lutheran confessions every year. And hearing it read brings a different way to engage with the text than just reading. And I commend doing both reading and listening both bring such blessing as you continuously re-engage with the wonderful texts of our Lutheran confessions. But I sincerely thank you, Pastor Lane, for doing that work and making that available and especially wanted to commend that to our listeners again here today. Well, it was a real labor of love. And I was reminded of how C.S. Lewis often remarked that the reason he wrote books is because he wanted something that he could read. <laughs> and <laughs> as a dual parish pastor like yourself, I, I you know, I spent a lot of time on the road and one day I was wishing that there was a audio version of the Book of Concord so that I could listen up and down the road and and decided just to make one for myself. And I'm glad other people are benefiting from it as well. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, back before everything got shut down, one of the things I would do with this show is actually go to the studios of KFO in St. Louis to record, especially when we kind of had a cohort of folks that we, uh, you know, a whole panel that would gather together and we do that in the studios in St. Louis. And so I would often pull up that audio recording on LibriVox and listen to the article that we were going to cover that day. And it was a good way to get it in my mind to go. So I'm really serious when I say your voice is the voice of the Lutheran confessions for me. It runs in the background as I even do this show. So that's fantastic work. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, let us go ahead and uh, dive into the text ourselves here today. And so, as I said, today we're starting Article 11 of the Formula of Concord. And on this show, we read from the Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord. That's available to you from Concordia Publishing House, the publishing arm of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. This is Article 11 from the Epitome of the Formula of Concord, God's Eternal Foreknowledge, or Predestination and Election, Paragraph 1. No public disagreement has arisen among the theologians of the Augsburg Confession about this article. But since election is a comforting article, if treated properly, 
and to prevent offensive disputes about it in the future. It is also explained in this writing. All right, so Pastor Lang, thus far our epitome, but having now worked through 10 articles of the formula on this show, we've seen a definite pattern that the confessors use. But here in Article 11, the way they frame this, I called it the status of the controversy and setting up the show today, but really we don't even have that heading in the, at least the reader's edition of the Book of Concord. But that is kind of what we generally do in the, the way we formatted the show to go through the formulas. This is somewhat different, though, here. Here we have, they say, there is actually no public disagreement. And that's kind of the status of the controversy is that there's no public disagreement. But can you go ahead and give us a brief overview of why they have framed this article differently than they have the previous 10? Well, yeah, it's, it's a remarkable thing, isn't it? That we've had, you know, all the 10 of them had to do with something that was specifically at odds between the Lutherans. And here... There's no other doctrine like this where there's no controversy and yet they still wanted to insert it into the formula. You know, you can think about things like baptism or a special article on the doctrine of God or something like that. And they don't do that for any other article, but they do it for election. And I think that that tells us something right there about how important this is for the doctrine. You know, the other thing they could have done, and we'll talk about this more as we get into it, but they could very well have enveloped this article within Article 2 concerning the free will, because the two are so closely related. But even that they didn't do. And uh, the fact that they decided to put a separate article in concerning election is amazing. And it starts off by saying that there is no public dissension or a public disagreement. And I just want to step back and appreciate that first off. How many articles of faith can we say, even among ourselves in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, there is no public disagreement? And yet here, today, it's a very contentious article across denominations and even historically has been contentious within the Lutheran Church. And yet they were able to say at the writing of the formula that there was no public disagreement. I think that's remarkable, and I think it testifies that they knew something about the doctrine of justification. They knew it so clearly that election became obvious to them. And if there's nothing else that we can accomplish today, I hope that we can maybe polish and brighten the doctrine of justification so much so that it becomes obvious and clear to us. And maybe one more final remark here. You think back and realize that these men who are writing had no public disagreement, and yet they wanted to include the article and they specifically say, in order to prevent offensive disputes about it in the future, they had to be able to see ahead and realize that this would indeed come into contention as the doctrine of justification became denied in various ways. And I think that prescience in, in writing is also a remarkable fact that we should take to heart. Yes, certainly. And I would also say that it's interesting for me as well that this is probably one of the longer articles that's included, at least in the epitome of the formula of Concord. And I, I didn't do an exact paragraph or word count or anything of that nature, but just certainly it has some great length to it, longer than some of the other ones that maybe you would think would get some more treatment and so forth. But to me, that highlights exactly what they say here in paragraph one, too that since election is to be a comforting article, and I think that speaks to what you were just highlighting as well, that you know we would come to understand this doctrine and as it's related to justification, which we'll certainly get back to. But they say, if this is treated properly, it is a comforting article. And that really seems to be quite the key to this whole article then. So can you unpack that term for us a bit more that that this would be a comforting or consolatory, as other translations would have for us, article. Yeah, well, that makes this article about the gospel. It is simply about the gospel. That's, that's what it means by a comforting article or a consolatory doctrine. And then it goes on to say that if treated properly, and I think you can see there that everything depends upon how this article is related to the other, other articles of the Christian faith. If it is treated improperly and kind of glommed on to some other article of the Christian faith where it really doesn't belong, it is no longer comforting at all. As a matter of fact, it becomes quite frightening. 
And I think this is where much of the modern dissension about this article has come from. It, it kind of gets stitched onto the articles of faith in the wrong place and becomes perverse and distorted and no longer comforts hearts. So yeah, take it uh, as a part of justification itself. And maybe just to kind of explain what I mean by stitching it on to the wrong article. So the doctrine of election is not fundamentally an article which explains anthropology. If it's stitched on to the article of anthropology, then the article of election becomes something that says something about either our free will as human beings or our lack of free will. And this is kind of the Armenian concern. And as soon as we get into that Armenian concern and our way of thinking about election with relation to our free choices, decision, if you will, suddenly we're, we're, we're on shaky ground and we can't ever be sure of our election because we can't be sure that we've decided rightly or that we will keep on deciding rightly. And then on the other hand, you've got the, the whole Calvinistic side of it where, where essentially what John Calvin wanted to do is stitch this article onto the doctrine of God. And so election becomes primarily about the sovereignty of God. And as soon as you do that, and you're talking about it in terms of, of the sovereignty of God, no longer can you be sure of your election because you can't read God's mind. And he dealt with that in, in strange ways, which we might talk about in the future. But, but just that idea that it's, it's when it's stitched on to the doctrine of God, it lands you in the wrong place. And so what the Lutheran confessions do here, and Lutherans historically, is that the doctrine of election is a subcategory of soteriology. It fits with soteriology, and if it's not talked about under the article of soteriology, it is perverse. But when it is talked about under the article of soteriology, then it becomes that comforting article, as it was intended to be. And where it fits exactly under the article of soteriology is that it is first in the list of the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation. So that's the first thing. It's to know about election that it is first in the order of salvation, that God begins salvation, if you will. I'm talking in chronological terms, and properly speaking, that's not correct. But God begins our salvation with his own good will towards us in Christ Jesus. So that's the most important thing to know about the doctrine of election. And then the flip side of it, as uh, Lutherans are well aware, that any time that there's an aberration in the doctrine of election, then it goes directly to a contradiction of the article upon which the church stands and falls. Uh, that is the doctrine of justification. And so that's why it sits at such a pivotal point. Well, and as you've so skillfully pointed out there for us, too, the confessors are making this strong connection between justification and predestination or election. And as we've pointed out many times on this show, and as you just said yourself, that is the article upon which the church stands or falls, because that's the article of what scripture stands upon, right? This is who Jesus is, what he came for, and what he has accomplished for us, for our salvation. And so this is a primary importance, and I like how you said that there. Then it truly does become a comforting article for us. And so precisely because we base our doctrine as Lutherans, as faithful, confessional, scriptural Lutherans on scripture, rather than on human reason or church tradition or those sorts of things, this might be a good point then to go ahead and take a look at the scriptural foundations for where we would see predestination and election even come up. Yeah, and maybe to kind of introduce that, the first passage of Scripture, I just note for you what I was reminded of in Peeper's Dogmatics. He talks about election and says that it serves an auxiliary role to corroborate sola gratia. And, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking on it, and, and that struck me. It serves as an auxiliary role to corroborate sola gratia. It struck me because it, it would be easy to frame it the other way around and to say that election is a logical corollary uh, that flows out of sola gratia. And so to ponder why people would not say the second, but it would say the first. And what it reveals is that even though election, logically speaking, flows out of sola gratia, that alone does not make it a doctrine. And I think this is an important point to underscore. What makes election a doctrine is revelation 
not logic. And I think maybe as soon as I put it in that way, you can see why it is that the logic, the sheer hard logic of John Calvin led him astray because he let the logic lead rather than the revelation. So if we make that point and then go on from there to, to look at the scriptures, I think it, it, it frames it in a, in a much more solid and again, comforting way. Well, I might interrupt for just a second, just because this has kind of become a soapbox on my show. And I agree with you, but I always like to highlight this, that I've kind of shifted my own talking to more to the human reason and away from logic, because I think that there's something profound about what God does when in John chapter one, he says that Jesus becomes the divine logos that takes on human flesh. I mean, the idea of logic had been around with the ancient Greeks and had been present on the earth for quite a while. And that's generally what we're talking about when it comes to logic. And there's certainly a great place for understanding logic. But then I think it supports our point that when we're talking about revelation, it's revelation of the divine logic of God. And so we're not necessarily speaking against logic itself so much as our human understanding, our human reasoning, which is under the curse of sin, of course, it's, it's broken. And what we're ultimately seeking is what is true logic that transcends everything. It's truly transcendent as it comes to us through Jesus, through his word, the Holy Scriptures to us. And so that's just kind of my soapbox that I kind of get on this show from time to time. And so it was a good point to highlight that. But then in that sense, then go ahead and give us that revelation, the divine logic of this doctrine from scriptures. All right, well, let me just give you a few passages in no particular order, but they need to be kept fully in mind. Let me begin with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, that's St. Paul, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So there you have it. Before the ages begin, you have the concept of the eternal election right there. And you also have the contrast. You can see that the election is contrasted with works. So not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. And then finally, you have in Christ Jesus, uh, which is an important corrective that it's not what they call nude election, but it's always an election of grace, and it's always an election in Christ. So the election of grace underscores that it is on account of God's sheer gifting and not on account of anything that we've done. And then an election in Christ make sure that it always remains bound up together with the whole order of salvation so that you can't isolate one aspect of the order of salvation from the others and a claim that one thing happens while the other didn't. Um, so that's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Acts chapter 13, after a, a sermon that Paul preaches, it reports that when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, there's your soapbox, by the way, the word of the Lord being Jesus. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. There's the doctrine of election in the words appointed to eternal life. And yet there also is the order of salvation inclusive with the word they believed. So the election never happens apart from the atonement of Christ, and it never happens apart from faith which the Holy Spirit works. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is another key passage, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. That right there refutes the so-called article of double predestination where God chooses to damn some. There it specifically says it's because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And then it goes on. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But 
We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So there you have the God chose you. There's the election again, as an opposite of the people who chose themselves not to believe and who had pleasure in the truth. And we give thanks to God because he chose them. So again, everything is, is put on the work and action of God, but it's not it's never separated or separable from the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And again, this notion that God could kind of reach into a barrel and grab a handful of humanity, some by the legs, some by the arms, some by the scruff of the neck. And, and that's kind of the, the crass way of putting the Calvinistic view of election. No, God elects precisely by sending his son to atone for the sins of the whole world and then sending his Holy Spirit to cause the elect to believe. So faith, word, Jesus Christ is always bound up together with election. So I go into uh, maybe Ephesians chapter 1, right at the beginning of his epistle to, to the Ephesians. Paul says this, Blessed to be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. <laughs> you can't miss, there's a triune blessing going on there, and everything is about God's action, God's benediction, God's blessing. Even as he chose us in him, chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So there's a clear, simple statement of the eternal election again, chose before the foundation of the world. And then back to the text, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, or in the beloved one. Okay, so you got that word predestined right smack dab in the middle of it, but it's a predestination, as I said before, it's a predestination in grace, or of grace. Here he says, in love he predestined us. There's no notion ever anywhere in the scriptures of a predestination apart from love, a predestination of hate and condemnation. And then again, it's a predestination to what? Well, to adoption to himself as sons. That would be faith and baptism. And then it happens through Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is both the one who atones for the sins of the world and the one whose word brings us into that adoptive relationship. And that brings us to kind of probably the most famous, I think everybody goes to Romans chapter 8 first when you want to talk about election. And let's just touch on that, beginning with verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So there you have it, called, that's the calling of the gospel, the word of God, and then according to his purpose, that's what he has from the foundation of the world. And then it says it plainly, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So we've had this language of the firstborn before, and here it is again, predestination also, it's an individual thing, but it also involves the church collectively, predestination, firstborn among many brothers. And notice also in that verse that there is a distinction between God's foreknowledge and God's predestination. And this is a key thing, and, and I know that when you get into the uh, affirmative statements, you're going to spend much more time talking about this. But let's just lay down a marker here. There is a difference between God knowing ahead of time that something is going to happen and God actually destining, predestining that thing to happen. And so we need to recognize that distinction and recognize that God does both. But the foreknowledge is a foreknowledge both of the saved and also of the damned. The predestination is only a reference to those whom he has predestined to salvation. And then finally, we continue reading from Romans 8. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. 
So there we have what some have termed the order of salvation. That's what I've been calling it today. You always have to be really careful here that uh, we don't fall in with the Reformed when we use that phrase. The order of salvation is not kind of a series of check boxes that we need to accomplish in order to get saved. That's the way it's oftentimes used. But the order of salvation is not a chronological order. It is a logical order, though. Maybe to jump on your soapbox, a reasonable order, right? These are the things which are all involved in our salvation. God's choosing before the foundation of the world. God's calling us by the gospel in time. God causing us to believe that gospel in time. And God preserving us in that gospel until our last breath. All of those things are involved in predestination according to Romans chapter 8. And which you know, brings us to maybe the sharpest, most concise statement ever that Jesus gave in his uh, Good Shepherd chapter. And that is, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And that gets us back to the comforting part of the article, which I know we'll want to talk about more. Yeah, that's certainly an excellent walk through the key scripture passages, laying that out. I like how you say it lays down some markers for us for how we consider this doctrine, this article of our faith, as it is centered in the gospel and on God's grace, which is truly comforting, and also lays down some markers for then how we understand our Lutheran confession of this article over against perhaps some of the other historical contexts at the time, and also, as you have pointed out for us as well, even still today. And so we need to take a break. But on the other side of the break, we want to pick up there exactly this point of with this scriptural foundation, then how does this distinguish our Lutheran confession of this from scripture over against kind of the other parties of Christianity that are out there still today? So please join us right after this break. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. This is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller inviting you to join me every Monday afternoon on Cross Defense, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock here on KFUO Radio, where we take up curious topics, curious Christian topics, to excite our imaginations, equip our minds, and comfort our consciences with the supreme and beautiful clarity of God's Word. It happens on Cross Defense every Monday afternoon, 2 to 3, here on KFUO. Please make plans to join us. And if you can't join us live, check out the podcast at kfuo.org. Article 11 of the Epitome of the Formula of Concord by Jacob Andrea, translated by F. Bente and W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Election. Concerning this article, no public dissension has occurred among the theologians of the Augsburg Confession. But, since it is a consolatory article, if treated properly, and, lest offensive disputations concerning the same be instituted in the future, It is also explained in this writing. And welcome back to Concord Matters. That is the voice of Pastor Jonathan Lang, who has done this great labor of love for the church. We're very thankful for and commend again to our listeners. This is the audiobook recording of the Book of Concord that is in the public domain and is free, available through LibriVox. So we thank Pastor Lang for doing that wonderful work for us. I'm very thankful also that he has joined us again here today. And as we continue pushing forward here in this article that is of a comfort to us when it's centered on God's grace and the gospel, as is chief for us as Lutherans, as it is from Scripture. And we were laying that out just before the break so well. You were doing that so well for us, Pastor Lang. Thank you for that. But now, as we've seen this with that scriptural foundation of our Lutheran understanding of election, and I really like how you, you read from scripture and highlighted what is the right scriptural understanding of that as you went through that. That was excellent. But then let's go ahead and kind of back up then again and go to the historical context of this article. What were the Lutheran confessors combating at that time then? I mean, we've, we've laid out on this show several times that it often feels like you know, the Lutherans are kind of stuck in the middle, which is a faithful confession of Scripture. It's, it's not really a spectrum or anything. It is just faithful confession of Scripture. But on the one side, you tend to have the Roman Catholics, and we spend a lot of our time refuting them and their uh, erroneous teachings in the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, of course, the small called articles as well. 
even in, as in those documents, we also have in view kind of what is the other side, which is all the other reformers at the time that are kind of getting a little crazy and getting out there with their doctrines and teachings as well and distinguishing themselves as not of the same reform bent as we are as Lutherans coming out of the Reformation. And so go ahead and frame this article then for us kind of with those two sides in the historical context, and then maybe even as we might still see it uh, play out some today with the Roman Catholics on the one hand and the Reformed on the other in terms of their understandings of predestination. All right. Let me start with one of the early moments in the Reformation to kind of get our, our feet on the ground and then and then kind of take us even farther back in time and then fast forward. So we oftentimes forget this, that the article of election, even though it wasn't really the language they were using, it was looming in the background at the most decisive early salvo of the Reformation. Now, it's going to be a little bit too slight to say, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of characterize it this way anyway. After posting the 95 Theses, the argument almost immediately launched into Luther's challenging the authority of Rome. And that's where it went, and things got really nasty, and you know, back and forth in the, in the 1519, 1520, 1521, until Luther was excommunicated. But then, while all of this was going on, challenging the power of the Roman papacy, there was this Erasmus of Rotterdam was watching from afar, and of course a lot of people were applauding Luther's work. And Erasmus finally decided in 1524 that he wanted to wade in and basically say, you know, good job, Luther, but let me tweak your theology just a little bit here. And he wrote this book called De Libero Arbitrio, The Freedom of the Will. And this, you know, after a little bit of prodding, it took a while before Luther was persuaded that he needed to respond. But when he did respond, he wrote back in 1525, De Servo Arbitrio, The Bondage of the Will. And in that book, in in the the introductory pages, he gave Erasmus of Rotterdam the credit. He said this, You are the one and only assailant who has seen the central issue and gone for the jugular. And the jugular was the doctrine of free will. And of course, tightly related to that, sola gratia and election. And then we shouldn't forget that this is the book then, 12 years later, as Luther's kind of looking back over the course of his writing, he holds this one up as high as he holds up his catechisms. The Bondage of the Will, in his opinion, is one of his best books. History haven't, doesn't seem to have judged it that way, and maybe history re- needs to reconsider, but that, that is the fact. So now that we can kind of think about it that way, we need to go back and to the first time that election was touched on in the church, and that is uh, Origen. It would be about 200 years after Christ. And when he first touched on it, of course, Origen has his problems, and he could not see election as being helpful at all because he was spending so much time fighting against the pagans who had a fatalistic view of the world, and so he didn't want anything to do with election. But then a couple of hundred years after that, you had uh, St. Augustine, who was doing moral combat with Pelagius. And that's when election really started getting framed. So crass Pelagianism makes the unregenerate free will. It puts that into the driver's seat. So Pelagius would say that we are able to save ourselves by an exercise of the free will. That's what Augustine was up against, and that's when he cultivated and developed a careful look at the passages that we reviewed before the break. And you you can recognize in Pelagius some echoes that are very familiar with what Armenians do today in the whole decision theology thing, where free will is the cause of salvation. Now, as things moved on past Augustine, then in the Middle Ages, this semi-Pelagianism came in, and it was kind of intended to kind of split the difference. But of course, uh, you can't split the difference. And what semi-Pelagianism did is it invented this thing called prevenient grace. There's some kind of a, a gift of God which comes first apart from the gospel, apart from Jesus. But it's a kind of a an ability that God gives for people now to use it either to decide or not to decide for Jesus. That's semi-Pelagianism. And that's kind of where we were when Luther comes on the scene. Remember, in the course of all this, that Luther was a, was a monk. He was specifically an Augustinian 
monk. And so this kind of discussion was very clear to him and was in the foreground as he was doing his thinking. But here's a problem with Augustine, is that he tends to root his discussion of election in God's sovereign will. And it's not an election of grace, necessarily. At least he's not as clear and lucid on that as he ought to be. And for that reason, Luther kind of departed from Augustine and recognized the, the, the passages that we talked about before, that we are elect in Christ Jesus, elect in love, elect for adoption as sons. And that's where the accent of the doctrine of election as being completely tied up with sola gratia and completely tied up with the doctrine of justification. So that's kind of background. Roman Catholics to this day still tend to oppose the doctrine of election for the same reasons that Armenians do, because they want to have human free will have some role in salvation. Now, John Calvin, who had to have been well known to the reformers who wrote the Formula Concord, he was the one who, as we mentioned before the break, he attached the doctrine of election to the doctrine of God, and specifically to God's free will. And because uh, predestination serves to establish the sovereignty of God, that's how he came up with the doctrine, what's called double predestination. So for him, it's predestination is less about God's grace and more about undergirding God's power. And I like to think that Calvin, he kind of brought Augustine to, I don't know, he's the consummate Augustinian, you might say. And I think the, the very reason that Luther kind of was no longer eager to stand on the shoulders of Augustine for his doctrine of predestination is precisely why Calvin developed it and kind of took it to the wall. I don't know if your listeners are interested in this, but you might want to just look at, do a Google search for what modern Roman Catholics have to say about election. And it's not hard to find that they lump Luther and Calvin together still. But it's fascinating. Uh, when the discussion ensues, it's too clear that Calvin was a double predestinationist and Lutherans are not. But nevertheless, they lump them together because for them... The doctrine of sola gratia is itself suspect, and it's connected with a, re, with a predestination that they reject. So that's kind of where we get, and I guess that this brings us right to the threshold of maybe being able to talk about the Roman Catholic doctrine of uncertainty. Well, and as you talk about that then too, go ahead and highlight for us, why for the Calvinists is the doctrine of grace suspect? Because that seems to be a connecting factor then. Sometimes I say, you know, especially as you look at modern reform today, especially what we see broadly in American evangelicalism, if you hold that up to sort of the theological tenets, if you will, of the Roman Catholics at the time of the Reformation, and even still today in a lot of them, they really mirror each other quite a lot. That there is definitely a works-oriented connection, as we talked about on this show before, but there's also this uncertainty. And I like how you highlighted that, you know, the doctrine of grace is suspect. And that is an interesting thought because that would seem to be connected also with what you highlighted from Augustine, that if it's up to the sovereign will of God, well, how can we have any certainty? I can't climb into the mind of God except for what he has revealed to us in his word, which is very clear as you highlighted for us already in laying that foundation that is centered on God's grace. That It's very clearly connected there in his word. So how then is this suspect for the Calvinists and then connecting that into the Roman Catholic teaching here? So I, you know, I, I kind of organize this in my own mind in terms of the Trinitarian creed. And so as you were saying, Calvin uh, likes to uh, think of God in terms of the sovereign creator of all things, focusing particularly not on his good will to create so much as on his power to create. And so the uh, first article gets really almost reinterpreted as, uh, as an article, instead of being about God's grace, it's about God's power. And as you said, you know, when you can't, you, God's inscrutable in and of himself apart from Christ. And yet that's where Calvin is left in, is with the inscrutable God. So how do you know of your predestination if that's where you're left and if that's the handle that you're using to try to understand it? And there was simply no answer. Uh, except for that the later Calvinists developed 
the doctrine which basically said, well, if you are elect, then your life is going to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. So, so the Puritans who came over to America, especially by that time, had developed this idea that you confirm your election by looking at your works, which is a fascinating thing, because even while they were running away from the works righteousness of Rome, they wound right back into it through the back door. Now, the Catholics have a different uh, approach altogether, but it winds them up in very much the same place. For the Roman Catholic, they like to quote a passage from Augustine as kind of the bridge away from election. And this is fascinating. They say, God cre- or this, is, this is what they attribute to Augustine. God created us without us, but he did not will to save us without us. Now, you can read that in two different ways, right? God created us without us is obvious to everybody. When God said, let there be, there wasn't a man who was first there saying, I have decided to become, and so please God, make me. God created us without us. But here's the problem. Once you have a living human being who's fallen, then Augustine goes on to say he did not will to save us without us. Now, I'm convinced that what Augustine meant is that God did not intend to save us without also saving our will. But the way that the Roman Catholics read that is God did not intend to save us without our free will contributing something. And that's where we get into the works righteousness. So it is the work of Christ plus the work of the human free will is our salvation. So we're maybe to think about it this way. Calvin wants to approach the doctrine of predestination from the article of creation and particularly the power of the creator. The Roman Catholics want to approach the doctrine of election from the third article, regeneration, and particularly the activities of the regenerate man. And Luther wanted to focus our entire attention in the doctrine of election on the atonement of Jesus Christ and on the words which Jesus Christ speaks to us in his church. That's probably about the clearest way to think about the three different views of election and its relationship to human free will at those three articles of the creed. And I want to emphasize before I leave that, that I'm not wanting to give credit that either that Calvin rightly understands the first article or that the Romans rightly understand the third article. I'm just bringing in from their perspective of how those articles are employed, whereas from our perspective, they have been skewed somewhat. And Maybe just to bring in from our own Lutheran catechism what we're talking about here, think about these phrases from the three articles from Luther's explanations. Article 1, near the end, he says that God has done all this, quote, without any merit or worthiness in me. Right? That's a statement of saying that God created us without us. But it doesn't only stay in the first article. Luther then comes back to this theme in different words in the second article when he says he has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, preacher, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil. You notice there there's total monergism. Jesus is doing all the heavy lifting, and I'm simply being done too in the second article of the Creed. And then the third article of the Creed, of course, we have that famous beginning, I believe that I, by my own reason or strength, that I cannot believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. And so the Holy Ghost must call me by the gospel, enlighten me with his gifts, and so forth. So you can hear that monergism going on in all three articles of the Creed, and that's the proper understanding of the triune God involved in my salvation and how election and soteriology are just inseparably wedded together. Well, and we love catechism connections on this show. And I think also makes it really quite clear for us then, too, that the Lutherans really are quite distinct. You know, I said earlier, you know, we kind of feel like we're stuck in the middle at times, but there really is no middle. There's just clear confession of what Scripture clearly teaches us. And you've been highlighting that really well for us and how that influences our true logic, the divine logos, what he has revealed to us to be true, 
And so then the Lutherans really are quite distinct in our confession of this. And we attribute everything in terms of our salvation, our justification, entirely to God's election, which is an election of grace. And so then go ahead and lay that out a little bit further for us here. How then do these doctrines of predestination and salvation really fit together then? Well, I, I, maybe the best way to go at this would be to go back to that terminology of the order of salutis. So we are familiar with the formula that we are saved by grace through faith, propter Christum, for the sake of Christ. And there you have three things involved, right? You have for the sake of Christ, the, the atonement, the atoning work of Christ, everything that he did for us men and for our salvation from the moment of the conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary to his session at the right hand of God the Father. We have the work of God the Father involved with uh, it is by grace alone that it is nothing that we have deserved, but not by my own merit or worthiness, but God's gift alone. And then we also have involved the gift of the Holy Spirit, namely faith. So by grace, through faith, for the sake of Christ. What election simply stipulates, and again, not by logic, but by revelation, is that God did all these things for us because he chose us before the world began because he decided to, that was just his will and his purpose for you, for me, before the world began. And it becomes clear from St. Paul, and also our Lutheran divines understand this and teach this excellently, particularly in this article, that the doctrine of election serves the purpose of comforting the believer. Don't talk about the doctrine of election if you're talking about an unbeliever, about how to go about saving you know, the people who have not yet heard the gospel. This is not a doctrine for that situation. The doctrine of election only comes up in the scripture when the believer is looking at Christ, thankful to God for bringing him into the faith, praying to God that he will persist and persevere in the faith until he dies, but also worried because we look around the world and we see all of the, the darts of the evil one and all of the various ways that he can twist the mind and draw us away from Christ. And we wonder if we're going to persevere. And here is where the doctrine of election is then preached to the worried Christian. I mean, God says that I chose you from the foundation of the world. I chose you. If you would have had even a little, an iota, of responsibility in your salvation, you would have messed it up by now. But I chose you. And because I chose you, then you also have confidence going forward that if I chose you and I gave you the gospel and I caused you to believe the gospel, then I also will not allow anybody to pluck you out of my hand. And so bottom line is we always want to take the entire order of salvation, beginning with the eternal decree of election for the saved, beginning with the eternal salvation, take them all together. And it is one ball of wax. All of that is together. It can't be separated out. And so we can be comforted by looking at the word of God as it reaches us today. The very fact that I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, and call on him to help me continue believing and his answer is always yes and amen. So then with just a couple minutes left here, go ahead and give us any parting thoughts that you have that as we'll go into the affirmative theses, affirmative statements on the next show, and then into the negative statements, the things that we reject and condemn and so forth. What's kind of our roadmap for how this is then our truly comforting article and why it's really good to have clear confession on this? One of the things that is a hallmark of a misunderstanding and a misappropriation of the doctrine of election is when uncertainty arises. And you can see this both in the Roman Catholic aberration as well as in the Calvinistic aberration for different reasons. For the Roman Catholic, they, because the involvement of the free will has to be a part of salvation, and therefore has to be motivated in their hearers, they deliberately leave an uncertainty, deliberately teach that no Christian can ever be absolutely certain of election. 
And so it's something that they're always striving for and never can be comforted in. The problem with that is that if there's an always an uncertainty of salvation, then you cannot, by definition, believe. You cannot put your trust in Jesus. You have to constantly be taking your eyes off Jesus and putting your trust in yourself. And so as we go through the articles, affirmative and negative, we're always looking for that error and wanting to avoid that. For the same reason, or for a different reason, Calvinism always leads into that same uncertainty. You know, the, the decree of election, according to Calvin, being connected with the sovereignty of God is irrevocable. That's for sure. But in practicality, there is no way that you can point a Calvinist to the eternal decree of God because God does it without speaking in Calvin's thought. And so the only way to point a Calvinist to answer the question whether they are among the elect or not, and of course the Bible is constantly speaking about the elect, and so everybody wants to be in that group. But the only way to, to know whether you're one of the elect or not is to look at your works and see whether you're doing the works that the elect are supposed to be doing. And that, of course, leads into uncertainty again, because we are poor, miserable sinners. And any time we look at ourselves honestly, we cannot but conclude that we are not among the elect, because look at our sins, and it takes our focus off of Christ and so the true doctrine of the election is always going to lead us to look to Christ. It's going to look to his atonement, and it's going to look to his clear and certain word. And when we have that, there is no doubt that if God has given us Christ, if God has given us his word, if God has given us his faith, that it can only be because God has chosen us in eternity. That is Pastor Lang. Very faithful confession from you there. Thank you so much for that, Pastor Jonathan Lang. And thank you for your labor of love and recording for the church, the audiobook of the Book of Concord, available for free on LibriVox. And thank you also for joining us for Concord Matters today and setting up for us the history and overview of the Lutheran Confession of the article on God's eternal foreknowledge, predestination, and election from the Formula of Concord, Article 11, which is centered on God's grace, the gospel and thus a truly comforting article. Thank you. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church.